On December 10, 1964, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. stood amidst an august body of world leaders at the University of Oslo in Norway to accept the Nobel Peace Prize. In this moment, he stated, I refuse to accept the view that mankind is so tragically bound to the starless midnight of racism and war that the bright daybreak of peace and brotherhood can never become a reality. That day, today, and tomorrow are all the same. They are not moments in time, but a movement of our time to end racism in our world. Greetings and welcome to the Urban Affairs Coalition's online conversation to end racism. It is indeed a movement, not a moment. I am personally so excited to be a part of this important conversation that I believe will touch lives and make ripples. Get ready, get ready, get ready. Social distance doesn't mean we can't be engaged as ever before on the topics of equity, on the topics of recovery, and on the topic more broadly of what kind of society do we want to live in. This is a time where we need to come together, and it's a time where we need to sustain each other for the journey, and UAC is at the center of this. The Urban Affairs Coalition was founded to bring together business and community leaders to solve urban problems. And over the years, it has done just that. For over 50 years, this organization has advocated for our communities in order to effectively balance strategy, hope, and audacious investment against what has been systemically atrocious. It is perhaps the only organization in the area with substantial representation from the business, labor, religious, education, and grassroots communities. The incomparable Charmaine Matlock Turner the mighty UAC board and staff continue to remind us that no matter what role you're in, you are always in a role of service. It is up to you as to whether or not you accept that role and accept that our race, gender, ethnicity, sexuality, religion, complexion, zip code, nationality, and income be constant indicators of how well you get to do in this life, and more importantly, how long you get to live it. That is the beauty of UAC's work and the burden of UAC's purpose. Today, we call attention to the opportunity all of us have to ensure this is a movement that produces meaningful results and drives positive change. There needs to be a fundamental change in how we operate as a society. And that starts with you and it starts with me. And I take my role very seriously I'm as a father, as a Philadelphian. We're both honored and humbled to be a part of this conversation facilitated by the Urban Affairs Coalition who is uniquely well positioned with their role as a change leader, a catalyst, and certainly a facilitator to bring about systematic change in our communities, which is needed now more than ever. We are here for all communities to fight for equity, and UAC is the right leader for this conversation. Let us join UAC to end racism and build up our communities. Thank you for joining us today and stay safe. I'd like to take a moment to share some special words from North Philadelphia's own Kenneth C. Frazier, the visionary chairman and CEO of Merck, who so eloquently stated this truth, opportunity and justice should not be reserved for some in our society. It is imperative that we come together to address the ills that have plagued our country for too long and develop sustainable solutions to move forward. UAC is well positioned to lead this work. Those who continue to lead this work at UAC include our fabulous board, partners, and employees, people who get into good trouble and do this good work on the ground every day. They know that they are part of a movement, not a moment. Just one year ago, 
we celebrated the Urban Affairs Coalition's 50th anniversary. Since then, much has changed. COVID-19 has exposed fatal inequities in our healthcare system. Widespread outrage about persistent racial injustice has poured onto our streets. Economic uncertainty has put families on the financial brink, and we saw the results of a historic election. Through it all, the coalition, together with our partners and the city of Philadelphia, has continued to improve the quality of life, build wealth, and solve critical issues in our region. Together, we have assisted with contact tracing, distributed face masks, and helped to move homeless populations into safe shelters. We've also helped to revolutionize civic engagement and voter participation. It is a movement, not just a moment. It is a movement to change society for the better. It is a movement to amplify the voices of the marginalized communities. And it is a movement to create a new state of play. UAC is here to lead in this important work. It's not always going to be easy. It's not always going to be comfortable. But I know that together, we can be the change we need. Today, I look forward to our conversation with the business and civic community that will help to jumpstart these efforts, build trust, push issues of diversity and inclusion, and most importantly, lead us to permanent change. Dan, it is so good to see you. So glad you're here. This is our 51st celebration of the Urban Affairs Coalition. Can you believe it? Charmaine, I can't believe it. I'm, I sometimes think that you and I have been together for all 51 years, but uh, you look too great and I'm not that old, so uh, n nor are you. <laughs> but, I, but I have to say this, Charmaine, I, when I reflect on all the incredible things that have gone on at the Urban Affairs Coalition over the years, uh, with your, lead, your incredible leadership, with a great board, a great team, um, you, you've, you've changed communities and you've made us all believe uh, that we can become a more unified, uh, a more equal, and a, a more progressive community in the sense of reaching out and helping as many people as we possibly can. Thank you very much, Dan. So I really appreciate you uh, joining um, this conversation today because I hope that this will be a catalyst for others to um, be, feel comfortable uh, to talk about what I call the R word. We've talked about, you know, discrimination and other kinds of things, but, but racism is at the core of a lot of the concerns uh, that we have. So thank you so much um, for being a part of this and being a great partner, um, not only as an individual, but as an organization uh, for us to really move this conversation uh, and this work ahead. As you think about talking about racism, um, I think a lot of it we forget is really personal. Um, the idea of how we feel about others, whether it's the power of women or whether it's Native Americans um, or whether it's people who've grown up in different countries, how we think about each other a lot depends on what our families say. So when you think about talking about racism in your own family, and I know you're now a grandfather like I'm a grandmother, um, how are you going to have that conversation with your grandson or your granddaughter? I've learned so much over the past, as many of us, many of us, regardless of our race, regardless of our background, have learned over the last several months. And, and, and the conclusion I've come to that um, how we feel about others, uh, regardless of how we classify them in terms of gender or race or sexuality or whatever it might be, is really a, a personal, individual journey of the mind, of the heart, and of the soul. And, and, and I think that for me to progress on that journey, it has been um, an, an opportunity, or I've taken the opportunity to look in the mirror and really assess as best I could, what, 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 what do I think in terms of other people's? Um, do I have negative thoughts that, that, that I, I just can't help? They come into my mind. What is in my heart? 
and, and then frankly, when you combine the both, uh, what's in my soul? And, and so I, I, I have identified areas where I feel that I need to rethink and reboot my, my mind and reboot my heart so that I can be a beacon uh, for my family members, for my friends. Um, and, and I think it's as, it's as basic as, as not tolerating uh, uh, comments or jokes at the expense of others, uh, whether it be a physical or behavioral issue that, that might be obvious, uh, whether it be race or religion or anything, you, you just cannot tolerate it. And it starts with yourself. I need to be uh, the one in my family that helps my children uh, and their children, our relatives, understand that that's my perspective on this and that this is a journey that we as a family uh, and as you, as the ripple effect goes out, we as a neighborhood, we as a broader community, need to really focus on getting our hearts, our minds, our hearts, and our souls right. I absolutely agree. I think making sure that we have a personal commitment to ending racism gets us past, is this about what you do or is this about what you just say? Um, I think it will make a huge difference when our families, our friends, our neighbors see that this is about what we do and that we do it on a consistent basis. So Charmaine, how do you, how, how do you see us as a community, a broader community, doing just that? Coming together, continuing to have honest conversations, but then then actualizing it and, and helping each other along a journey of change where change is needed. I, I do believe that that part of really talking is absolutely critical. The other thing I think, Dan, is the tough part of really going back and really understanding history. How did we get here? We, we've tried to sort of pretend as if, you know, slavery in 1619 didn't kind, it kind of sort of happened. It really wasn't that bad, was it? Or, or it's like over, right? Um, through uh, uh, Reconstruction, through Jim Crow, through the period of hate and lynching, through the civil rights movement to today, it is critical that we also take the time to look at history, not from that I am saying, Dan, you did something wrong, but it's like saying, let's really sort of understand where racism came from. It came from an economic institution that was created by slavery, which then we constructed race as a way to justify it. We said, well, the reason that we can actually enslave someone is because they are inferior. And that then built the construct of how institutions at, responded to this whole issue of race and has built on top of it over time. So we have to get past the point of saying, is someone calling me a name? To let's really sort of understand how this really got started, what happened, so that we can make sure it doesn't happen again. You know, that's a journey that, that uh people that look like me need to be comfortable going on and, and need to understand that the, the pain that was caused uh, and continues to be caused because of the legacy of, of slavery, the, the, the legacy of racism, bigotry. Um, and by recognizing and truly understanding what went on, we can be part of the solution going forward. And, and what, I've, what I've committed to um, at the ripe young age of 64 is uh, listening and learning as much as I can. And, and I think it's important that, that those of us that were not on the same, don't have the same experience of slavery as an African American, for example, that we allow ourselves to be hit in the gut uh, in a way that, that makes us truly become part of the change, not, as you said earlier, uh, say the right things, but truly become part of the change. Uh, Dan, you're, you're absolutely right. I, I think part of it, though, is that we don't want to mix miss the time of actually talking and sharing and really talking about our own personal experiences. Um, I had an opportunity several years ago 
to talk to a friend of mine, and I said, you know what, um, who, who was white, and I said, you know what, I'd love to be able to have some dinners where you invite somebody who's black in your network, I'll invite someone who's white, and let's just have some conversation, um, and, and, we're not, and it can't be political. So I don't want you to come and just talk about your candidate or your political point of view. I want you to come and for us to talk about our own personal experiences. And so we did about five of those, which was absolutely tremendous. People who came were excited by the conversations and were willing to share and started to build some bridges. And, and Charmaine, if I can, thank you for, for sharing that. And um... Well, we have seen as, as Independence Health Group, uh, AmerHealth Caritas, and all the entities that are affiliated with, with Independence, uh, the, the, the poignant fact that there, is bar there are barriers that are faced by the African-American community and other uh, communities of color that are uh, a, a detriment to folks getting the highest level of quality care. I believe it's not a mistake that, that there are, uh, the percentage of African-American people that have, uh, that have uh, uh, been diagnosed with COVID-19 is far greater than the Caucasian community. Uh, it's, there's no mistake that when people do have it uh, of, of African-American descent, that they show up in an emergency room, not necessarily at a primary care physician's office. Uh, there's no mistake that barriers exist in the system that uh, are, are not of themselves today, I would call racist, but they create a situation where not all of us are treat, created, or excuse me, treated equally across the healthcare system. On the whole, the African-American community less healthy than other communities. And so um, that's what I mean by taking to heart and learning and then on not only our personal and, and through our personal lives and endeavors, but through our professional endeavors, truly begin to break down the barriers, uh, make sure the disparities are no longer acceptable and begin to truly monitor that the health status of the African-American community improves in a dramatic way over the next several years. Uh, we need to recruit others. We need to uh, be beacons ourselves to bring folks of all backgrounds, of all races, together to, uh, one, say, the only thing we're going to tolerate is positive change. Uh, we're going to not only talk about it, but we're going to uh, make sure we influence those changes in the public sector, in the private sector. And I believe where real change can occur when the public and private sectors come together to solve uh, issues in the community. And there is no greater issue that needs to be solved in our broader community than racism and the negative in impact it has on everything uh, that is important to us as a, a, a universe of, of men and women. Thank you, Dan. Thank you very, very much. Um, this has been a terrific conversation. Um, I really appreciate your candor, but as importantly, your hard work uh, in this space and knowing uh, that we're going to be able to count on you um, as we all continue this work together. Um, as you know, we are not going to allow this just to be a moment. Uh, this is a movement. Uh, the coalition started 50 years ago after the assassination of Dr. King in partnership with the business community, with government, with activists, with communities, because we said we must drive change. And we are still committed to that work. We know that we have more work to do, but we are going to stay in partnership with you and others to make sure that we do ultimately in racism, in our city, in our state, in our country, and in our world. Thank you, Charmaine. This has been an honor. This year, our nation has tragically again witnessed unacceptable instances of racial injustice. We reject hate and discrimination in all of its forms. 
We at BBNT Now Trust believe we have a part to play in ending racism. We've acknowledged our own contributions to inequality, encouraged internal teammate dialogue, and have taken actions to be better. As our CEO Kelly King recently wrote to all Truist teammates, we'll never be able to adequately right the wrongs of the past. But as our obligation as leaders in the business community to publicly and passionately condemn these injustices with greater commitment, focus, and energy. I wanna thank the Urban Affairs Coalition for being a terrific partner in our shared common goal of improving lives and helping level the playing field. I look forward to our continued relationship to further our efforts in social equity. Issues of racial equality and economic opportunity are deeply connected. Where there are racial injustices, there is often a lack of economic opportunity and mobility. At Bank of America, as we drive our focus on equitable economic opportunity, we'll continue to focus on partnerships that drive change and address these critical challenges as we collectively work to do more. There is no better example of a critical partner in this work than the Urban Affairs Coalition. Under Charmaine's leadership, the Urban Affairs Coalition will continue to ensure that thousands of our city's most vulnerable are part of our region's recovery. Just one example of our shared priorities is the importance of jobs. I am proud to chair the Summer Youth Employment Cabinet to expand the number of summer work experiences for young people in Philadelphia. We are only one of many corporate supporters, but we need that list to grow, and we know it can and will. Westcott is committed to a leadership role in ending racism and promoting diversity. We do so in a number of ways. We have a diverse staff with an ongoing program to further our racial diversity. We achieve certified B Corp status, evidencing our commitment to balance purpose and profit. We fund and lead and board service to our profession's national organization for a racially and gender diverse professional workforce. We fund and lead and board service to Temple University's Beasley School of Law in its education of a diverse bar and for legal services for social justice. And as a firm, we build investment portfolios focusing on excellent companies that promote diversity ideals. But there's no better commitment than supporting UAC as we do, because this is a movement, not a moment. Hi, I'm Rodney McLeod, and on behalf of the Philadelphia Eagles, I want to thank the Urban Affairs Coalition for providing the leadership, guidance, and dedication to our community during this difficult yet inspiring time. The past six months have brought tremendous heartbreak to so many, but we have been inspired by how this pain has galvanized our communities to turn these moments of grief into a movement to act and end racism in all of its forms. As evidence, consider the recent election where hundreds of millions of citizens turned out to vote. This record turnout was thanks in part to so many who did so much to encourage supporters to make sure their voices were heard. Just one example of this was the work the Eagles did to reach over 9 million fans, educating them on where to get registered and how they could vote. All the way up through election day, where I was so proud to have teammates join me on a bus tour around Philadelphia, reminding fans in all of our neighborhoods to go vote. This enthusiasm continues to this day. So many forms through our intentional actions that will bring the significant change we all want to see in this city our country, and our world. I'm so proud to say this is a movement, not a moment. Let's keep this moving together. At the Philadelphia 76ers and Harris Blitzer Sports and Entertainment, we are fully committed to using our platform, brand, and business to champion equality and address the long-term impact that systemic racism has had on the black community. We will continue to speak out against racism, work with diverse businesses, support education, health, and employment programs for our youth, and invest in the communities where our fans live, work, and play. This is a movement, not a moment. PICO and Exelon are, and have been, committed to equality, equity, diversity, and inclusion. There is no room in our company for hate, intolerance, discrimination, or harassment of any kind. To show that commitment, we know we need to do more than just provide clean, affordable energy to our customers. 
That's why we work to integrate our corporate values into everything we do for our customers and our colleagues. And that's why we're taking action both inside and outside our headquarters to support the black community and eradicate systemic racism. Internally, we develop diverse talent and appoint executive leaders who reflect racial and gender diversity. And we educate and support our employees to help foster an inclusive working environment. Externally, PICO's efforts began more than 50 years ago when we became one of the founding organizations of both the Urban Affairs Coalition and Philadelphia Academies Incorporated. That support continues today. So on behalf of our president and CEO, Mike Inocenzo and 2,700 employees, I'd like to thank Charmaine Matlock-Turner for her exemplary leadership and the entire Urban Affairs Coalition team for facilitating this timely and very necessary discussion. At PNC, diversity, equity, and inclusion is core to our value. We have long embraced DE&I as a business imperative. That said, recent events have moved conversations and actions involving diversity, equity, and inclusion further and into the forefront. In June of this year, PNC committed $1 billion to help end systemic racism and support the economic empowerment of Black Americans and low to moderate income communities. As outlined in our announcement, the majority of this commitment will come to life through the work you will see in community development banking every day in and around Philadelphia and across PNC's retail banking footprint. Although our commitment to low and moderate income communities is not new, we are now approaching this work with a more deliberate focus on the Black community. Because we want to take steps that will result in meaningful change, we are taking the time to listen, learn, and gain greater understanding of the opportunities before us. All of these efforts reflect the shared focus we have with UAC, ensuring our contributions are used to help strengthen and enrich the lives of our community members. We know that the structural barriers in the U.S. have created profound racial inequities that have only been exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. The existing racial wealth gap puts a strain on families' economic mobility and restricts the U.S. economy. J.P. Morgan Chase recently announced new long-term commitments to advance racial equity. That announcement includes plans to harness our expertise in business, policy and philanthropy and commit an additional $30 billion over the next five years to provide economic opportunity in underserved communities, especially the Black and Latinx communities. Locally, we've just committed $5 million to increase diverse representation in Philadelphia's construction industry. As part of our commitment to Philadelphia and to bridging the racial wealth divide, we've made a major commitment to Urban Affairs Coalition. I'm proud to announce a commitment of $110,000 to UAC, which will support their work with nonprofit organizations in Philadelphia that are solving emerging needs and improving the quality of life in neighborhoods throughout the city and region. This partnership with UAC is consistent with our belief that we need to invest in organizations that are working to achieve equity. We know that for UAC and JP Morgan Chase, this is a movement not a moment. I am pleased to introduce UGI's BIDE imperative. BIDE is belonging, inclusion, diversity, and equity. Four components purposefully listed in order. We are taking a holistic approach and are pursuing actions in four core pillars, which are aligned to complement and leverage one another. This is a movement, not a moment. I am proud to work for an organization that believes it is important to step forward and promote social and economic equity in order to help eradicate racism and discrimination. One that is driving change and making an impact so that all people and communities thrive. We have been a long-standing partner of UAC and we are proud and humbled to be a part of this timely and crucial conversation. This is a movement, not a moment. I am inspired by the collective wisdom, will, and commitment shared with us today. Convening a conversation about ending racism is not a small act. Participating in the conversation is an important step forward. I challenge all of us to answer the question, who else will help advance this movement and transform these words into action? 
In the weeks and months ahead, we will launch the Ending Racism Partnership, energized with a cornerstone investment from Independence Blue Cross, thanks to Dan Hilferty and Greg Devins. This citywide initiative will hold space for listening and reflection in neighborhoods. It will take dialogue to heal us all as a community. While these conversations will be difficult, this grassroots initiative will drive impact and create permanent change. Together, we can learn from the events of 2020, and we shall establish priorities shared by communities, businesses, and government that serve as an authentic basis for healing and rebuilding our society and ending racism once and for all. And we need you to join us and inspire every soul to be the generation that ends racism. When we unite, the dream will be our reality. This is a movement, not a moment. And you can join us now at www.uac.org backslash ending racism. Thank you all so very, very much for being here with us today. Thank you for all of your support. Celebrating our 51st year, we will make this happen.